Um, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Um, so if you don't know me, uh, my name is Keenan Irwin. I am the brand manager here at Made Brave. Uh, and I have with me uh, Emma Burnett Blair, who is our head of marketing. She is. Uh, and then we've got Mark Killen, who is our head of strategy. Um, just a quick intro for, for Made Brave, for anyone that is unfamiliar. Um, we are a strategic brand agency uh, based here in Scotland. Uh, we have over 40 people on the team. Um, we have, you know, we have brand and business strategists. We have designers. We have animators. We have illustrators. Um, we have an in-house content production team uh, that creates film, 3D animations. Uh, they do photography. And then we also have a digital team that covers things like UI, UX, um, digital design systems, websites, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then we also have a couple of uh, made brave dogs um, that mostly get up to no good. Um, thankfully, they're they're kind of um, <laughs> they're they're up to no good remotely right now. Um, so we were uh, recently named um, by the Drum uh, the the top 100 independent agencies in 2019. Uh, we were also named one of Campaign's best places to work. Um, we've worked with uh, loads of amazing brands over the years, uh, many of them being global businesses uh, and across many different sectors and industries, uh, which is great because it gives us, you know, kind of an opportunity to take thinking uh, from one industry um, and then kind of apply that to another. Um, so that's always really interesting. Um, we used to spend our days in our brand new Made Brave studio. Uh, well, we, we did for a few weeks um, and then the coronavirus happened. <laughs> so now all we have are these pictures. Um, it's still there though, just waiting quietly for us, I suppose. Um, hopefully, hopefully uh, we can get back to that soon. Um, so uh, for some of those, uh, for, or, or for some of you who, who you know, have been following along for a while, um, we've been talking about this uh, this relaunch strategy uh, theme for a bit. Um, you know, there's plenty of uncertainty out there, of course, um, and a lot of businesses are kind of taking things, uh, you know, a week at a time, which is to be expected. Uh, but as we said during our last chat, um, there are things that, you know, there are a lot of unknowns, but there are things that are known. There are things that you can build a strategy off of. Um, and so if you missed that chat, uh, definitely scroll down the feed after we're done here and go check that out. Um, it was just a really great chat. Um, and then I think there's there's also a link on the website where you can go, um, it's called uh, COVID support. If you go look in the header, um, you can go find uh, some of the tips that we had in, in that chat um, there on the website. I'll kind of take you through. All right, um, so as, as the title suggests for today, uh, we're gonna be talking about uh, rebrands uh, versus brand evolution and you know what is potentially the best choice for your business and for your brand. Um, you know, we'll be talking about um, you know, what they are, what they aren't, the difference between those, um, what they're for, um, and then we'll give you some examples too. Um, and then if we've done our job, hopefully that'll that'll help some of you, you know, kind of walk away with a better understanding, you know, which way should we be leaning right now, um, you know, for your business. Um, we're going to take a slightly different approach in terms of the format today, um, you know, versus a, a regular webinar. Um, I'm just going to be asking some questions. I sent some questions over to Mark uh, and to Emma. Uh, they've, they've prepared a bit, um, so they're not totally caught off guard. Uh, there's not, there's not going to be any gotcha moments here um, or, or surprise guests or anything like that. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we just kind of wanted to move away from that standard format of having tons of slides and maybe just make this a little bit more conversational. Um, so we're going to go for about 30 minutes, maybe up to 45 minutes. Um, again, this is kind of our first time trying this, so we'll see. Um, but, you know, if you do have any questions, uh, just make sure to uh, just drop them in the comments. Uh, we'll be looking at those as we kind of move along. Um, if you start to write something up and you're like, ah, they've moved past it, just put it in there anyway, um, and we can maybe get to it at the end. All right. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I suppose, you know, kind of a, to, to preface all of this, um, you know, you know, we all know that brands need to change. Um, but, you know, why is that? Uh, why can't they just why can't they just stay the same, um, Mark? Why, why do you why do you think they need to change? Um, it's 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 funny. Uh, it, 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 because most people 
think of brands as a logo that yeah. they think that it's very static because you don't want to change that very often. Um, in reality, the world is constantly changing. Audiences are constantly changing. Your competition is constantly changing. Your products are changing. Mm -hmm. um, but because people's conceptions of brand is a graphical one and one that is plastered on the side of a building and not one you ever really want to change, they think that brand has to move almost not at all and then very suddenly has to move very, very quickly. And that's kind of what we're discussing yeah. is to say that brands need to change because the world is changing. Um, and that's the skill is in marketers and agencies and designers who understand what can stay the same, mm -hmm. what is locked in place, but actually what by design can change and can evolve and can shift. And that's where um, rebrands or refreshes or evolution, they're all basically different vari variations of and different e extremenesses of, of how much you can shift a brand on to reflect the world around you. Right. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Um, and what do you think? I, I mean, you know, what, what does, so obviously brands do need to change, um, but what do we, so what, what do you think brands tend to, or what do they stand to gain? Or what, what are some of the risks if they don't change? Um, well, I think you could have a very long list for both the, the pros and cons of each of them. I think Mark made a really interesting point there around, you know, in one sense, there's an element of semantic. Everything we're talking about today is about kind of change to some degree, whether in a refresh is smaller, more iterative changes versus a rebrand, which is you know, bigger scale, a lot more um, fundamental really to how you do things. Um, but but the, the gains from, from both aspects on kind of both sides of the spectrum are potentially substantial. Um, a big part of it is obviously about protecting your um, market share and future mm -hmm. for the longer term as well. Um, and that might be because the indicators that um, your brand is maybe under threat a little bit. Nothing too threatening, but you can start to see decline um, potentially in some metrics, even things mm -hmm. like engagement rates or your social media following, um, conversation volume if you're looking at things like social listening. There's all these in indicators that can start to show that um, you're maybe slipping and it's time for you to change something where um, and a brand refresh or, or an evolution might really help you do that. On the other end of the spectrum, there might be some more severe indicators that would suggest that you might need to embark on a bit more of an ambitious approach. So if you're seeing that you know, you're experiencing dramatic declines in sales or revenue or share, um, that is when you might need to start about something a bit um, bigger to, to protect your brand um, in future and make sure you've still got your market share and your, your customer acquisition and everything. Okay. So, I mean, in terms of, of doing something bigger where you're seeing that decline um, or whether there's an opportunity or whatever it is, um, you know, getting back to, you know, rebrands, what, what is that exactly? Mark, you had said people seem to kind of confuse it with just it being a change of logo, but it's more than that. Um, how, how would you define it? How do I define a rebrand? Um, yeah. It's well, it, it, it's because it's a large sliding scale. So a rebrand can be wholesale, change the lot, bin the lot, big, be, be bold. Um, but actually, that's very rare. Very, very rare you do that because most of the time, the challenge for agencies like us is measuring how much equity is locked up in your brand name, in your visual assets, mm. in. Mm -hmm. in just the impressions and the attributes that your audiences have for you. So what a rebrand is, is looking at business challenges. That's what, it, that's what it's rooted in. This is not a design exercise. This is not art. This is mm -hmm. what business challenges and applying your brand identity as it currently is to those challenges and asking, mm -hmm. is it the purpose? Does it need to change? Um, are there, it, 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 and if so, how much of a change is required? Um, the, you know there, there there are there are many examples of brands that that change and only the marketers necessarily see the change and then people then question the money that's been spent on it right 
over 10, 20, 30 years, brands are constantly shifting, constantly changing. And that's why the language that we're talking about here is, is trying to get people to think beyond this kind of rigid idea of what a rebrand is. A rebrand can be broken down into lots and lots of different iterative increment and incremental changes because they all work back from that business challenge. Then then there will there will be times when businesses need a big bold shift. But a mm -hmm. lot of the time it won't be. A lot of the time a slower iterative change is much smarter and also allows you to be a little bit more flexible in how you apply it to. Right. Right. Okay. Um, and and Emma, what would you say? I mean, so if that's if that's our rebrand, then if we're talking about brand evolution, so where do we where do we draw the line, or how do we tell the difference between the two? Well, I suppose there's always a bit of a, a grey area somewhere in the middle. It is a, a kind of scale, but I I'm very partial to an analogy, and I quite like the one around uh, sort of brand evolution being kind of like redecorating your house and you might get like right. is this because is this because you're decorating your house right now yeah well that's inspiration for this and I'm, I'm imagining you sitting there going, oh, okay. uh, yeah. yeah yeah so new paints new furniture and um, maybe being a bit kind of experimental trying out some new kind of things um but the underlying kind of structures is, is similar, they look a bit different. Um, but a rebrand would be like knocking down some walls or building mm -hmm. a section, going in a new kind of interior design direction. Yeah. Um, uh, and it's, it's a lot more uh, foundational and a lot more kind of committed. It's a bigger, you know, commitment of time, investment as mm -hmm. well. The, the, the risk is higher, but the reward could also be higher as well. So, um, yeah, kind of a nice way to think of it in, in my head anyway. Yeah, th th that is a really nice way to think of it. Um, yeah, so it's just changing a few things, whereas a rebrand is something that's more like extreme home makeover. <laughs> um, and that they, they almost don't uh, resemble each other. I mean, of course, in a rebrand, you, you do want that, that equity to carry over, as, as Mark was saying, but um, yeah, they look very different. Um, okay. Um, and then, you know, then going back to evolution, if we can get a little bit more granular or, or practical, what, what does that look like? Well, um, evolution? most of the time, um, you've got to separate out kind of campaign activity from brand activity, first of all. So most brands, whether they're B2C or B2B, will be doing campaigns, whether that's launching products, whether it's seasonal. Um, so that's more sales driven. So park that. In terms of the actual brand and how you evolve the brand, um, quite often it's in messaging. You know, again, forget the logo, just park it. What is your brand saying? How is your brand talking? Tone of voice is mm -hmm. very often a brief that we will get to say, look, we, 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 every single wall we have is painted the same teal blue. You can't change that. But how we are talking is old fashioned or how we are talking in different markets around the world isn't reflecting their cultures. How can we shift that on? Um, there's also changes that, that businesses can do to their, their value propositions or their market positioning. There may be a new disruptor that's moved into the market that's, that's, that's shaking everything up and they need to res respond to that and adapt to that. Now yeah. that could be a strategic change behind the scenes and the application of that might be a subtle little design tweak, but, most of the audiences won't necessarily clock that it's happened, but they will yeah, of course. consciously realize, ah, they're talking better, they're sounding better. It's still the same fundamental identity. Um, so it's all to do with incremental changes. And, and one thing about it is I, the reason I started there with campaigns, quite often what a lot of global companies do is they try things out in a campaign world, and then if it sticks, mm -hmm. like their brand. Yeah. So the most famous example of that is um, Nike's, the, 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 probably the most famous brand platform in the world, Just Do It. That was not the product of a rebrand. That was a that was a campaign that they ran for right. some products. Mm -hmm. And it just yeah. worked and they loved it. And then over time, it became the brand. So yeah. and that, that didn't require a rebrand. What that did was... They tested something, they found an interesting message, they applied it, it worked, they moved it upstairs, it became something more permanent. So 
e evolution most of the time tweaks all the other kind of building blocks that make up a brand so that really you don't necessarily even notice the name or the, or, or, or the overall identity. You right. Know? Yeah, yeah, no, that, that, that's good. Um, so, I mean, then in terms of, I mean, it, it's sounding pretty attractive, uh, a rebrand, it just feel, or a, sorry, a, a brand evolution just seems a little bit safer maybe, um, but there's, there, you know, you've kind of listed some of the benefits there. Are, are there any drawbacks um, Emma, would you say there are any drawbacks to a brand evolution? Uh, yes, I think there's always kind of pros and cons to everything, really. Um, I think in some cases, um, particularly if there are serious indicators that there's kind of a, a fundamental business issue in terms of how your kind of profit and, and revenue is running as well, um, mm -hmm. a refresh might be... Um, too little to solve the problem that you're you're right. doing. It might be like putting a, a plaster on a potentially mortal wound and then right. you do the job. You might need something um, bigger mm -hmm. as well. And that's maybe where you kind of lean towards more of the rebrand um, side of things. Right. Yeah, yeah. So it's it, it is nice that you can kind of slow that you can change over time, but if you need to change all of a sudden, um, it's just not the way to go. Yeah, definitely. I think um, just to maybe give a couple of examples there. One, uh, and this is looking at kind of a, a global global multinational scale um, businesses in particular, just because there's a lot of examples here. Mm -hmm. um, but you do see uh, rebrands occur if there was a scandal, for example, or a corporate crisis, sure. and a brand has to or, or wants to distance themselves from that and, and kind of turn over a new page, if you like, um, and a rebrand can help them do that to an extent. We've seen BP do that in the past. Mm. I think BP is a very interesting example because, you know, it was historically has been synonymous with environmental wreckage mm -hmm. uh, and, and various kind of uh, disasters and stuff and, and there was a big expensive rebranding process millions millions of pounds 130 million or something it was um, to help distance themselves and reposition as a more green um, and environmentally focused company and that came with things like a uh, substantial uh, new logo um, and investment mm -hmm. yeah but it was deeper than that. It um, involved things like uh, investments into new green energy um, and, and stuff. So it had this operational impact as well. But I think that's quite an interesting example because it starts to show the closeness between brand strategy and business strategy and how linked the two things are, particularly um, at that scale and we're looking at um, how your brand is going to have implications for how you operate the whole business uh, from the people and the process and the, the product as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the, uh, that's a, that's a great, uh, I completely agree. And one of the examples, another one of when a rebrand is it probably the best move, you're better as a business, regardless of your size, you're better off taking the hit is when you have brand architecture challenges. So a challenge that, that, that will come around quite a lot is not it's not an entrepreneur going, oh, I, I think things are looking a bit dry, it's time to jazz things up. No, more often than not, it will be a multinational conglomerate that has acquired other businesses, that has merged with other businesses, yeah. that has perhaps got a diverse product range, that e and each product perhaps has evolved into its own brand or sub-brand and it becomes, it ends up looking like spaghetti. Yeah. And um, and despite the best intentions to create a, a virgin style endorsed model, they turn up at, at branding agencies and consultancies like us, and they say, this makes no sense. The consumer doesn't understand. You'd be surprised how often this is the case. The response has to be, wow. you need to consolidate your, your, your brands. You need to, you need to, again, it's all about equity. It's all about the value that's locked up within that brand. You're now better off with one brand. You're not necessarily better off with 17. Now, that totally depends on the circumstances. If you're Unilever or P&G, it's a totally different model. But there are times when a rebrand is the required choice for that. Um, oh, and another example, which is very relevant to the Scottish market, is there are, there are windows that can open up for certain brands 
where it's advantageous for them to make shifts forward. So take something like whiskey, for example. Most packaging, which is the most expensive touch point for them, is on a life cycle. Eventually, they're going to have to refresh the bottle or refresh the, mm -hmm. the, the, or the, 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 or the secondary pack. When you do that, that's the biggest expense. Changing the glass is the biggest thing that they, they will do. Yep. So at that point, there's a window for them to go, all right, what's the business strategy here? Are we, you know, are we selling well in Shanghai? Do we need to diversify into that market? Are we, are we competitive? This is the opportune moment. So there are, there are times based on the business need when a bigger brand shift is, is, much, is, is wiser than a kind of a slow incremental evolution. But what final thought on that is, if you don't evolve, if you, if you only view your brand guidelines as being gospel and you don't gradually innovate and iterate your brand, what that does is it builds pressure. Mm -hmm. And that means eventually when it gets to that point where maybe a new marketing director, a new CEO takes over and goes, why is this not keeping up the scratch? Yeah. Uh -huh. It means you're going to have to have a much bigger rebrand at the end of it. And that's very expensive. So there yeah. are arguments there for slow, iterative, tactical changes that will then save you money in that long run as well. Yeah, I think on the, the on that point there, Mark, around um, the smaller iterative changes, we, we've spoken and given a few examples of big corporate brands or kind of big global brands. But if we look at maybe the other kind of end of the scale and, and smaller businesses or UK-based businesses, the iterative approach is, um, is, is can be really easy to do as well there's a lot of particularly digital means that make it really easy for you like if you pick what your kpis are that you're going to measure and um, whether it is say it was engagement rate just to give an example and you've seen decline in that and then you started to trial new tone of voice as, as mark had mentioned earlier on or maybe subtle changes like experimenting with the, the color palette you use or the visual style of photography and you can start if you get your kind of a b testing model in place you can start to get some really robust findings that give you those learnings that take you in the right direction and that can just become part of your sort of daily management of a campaign and the brand as well but if you keep chipping away at it, you know, three months' time, you could be in a significantly better place just mm -hmm. because of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we do just have a few comments here. Just want to shout out really quick. Uh, hey, thanks, Sean. Um, we... <laughs> we spent a lot of time on that office putting everything together. Um, it is a destination for us. We super miss it. Um, hey, Jenny. Hello to you as well. Um, and Trisha, thank you so much. Uh, it's good to hear that. Uh, this is so insightful for you. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, so getting back to, or well, not getting back to, we're just talking about it, but rebrands are, and Mark, you were talking about pressure and that building pressure um, uh, to, to do a rebrand. Um, and then quite, I mean, it's, Quite often, you see things in the news. Um, different brands will do a rebrand, and there's always this. You know, it's always quite divisive. A lot of times, you get people that really love it, and people that really hate it, and everybody has an opinion. It just seems like it can be this really. I mean, and of course, it is. It's a real. It is a risky thing to do. It's a scary thing to do. Um, but it, it, it kind of. Why do you think rebrands have a bad name? What What, what do you think is behind that? um well they do definitely they they do um quite often we will try and avoid that word wherever possible because it, it absolutely sends the willies up mds and ceos because it's because of the it's because of the idea that you're changing this big thing on on, on the side of the building and that mm. uh, and and really um the reason why is it's very very expensive to do at least the perceptions of it are expensive to do in, in, in amongst the wider media discourse, that expense is not always portrayed as being good value, which is total. Yeah. Massive. You know, when they say it costs a million pound to rebrand a business, no, you're talking multiple touch points. That's, you know, re redo a website, redo packaging, redo a building. That's where the money kicks in. Um, it's also hard to do. If, if any agency says, oh, uh, you know, we, we, we make rebranding easy, Really? You, you you can figure out, you can connect up a, a business strategy yeah, to language sure. execution easily. Well, good luck to you, because it's not. It's not easy. It's very hard to do. But more than anything else, it's risky. That's mm -hmm. it. It's risky. There are so many examples of 
big, bold, high pressure. And that's what that, that pressure cooker thing I talked about. When the, the spotlight is on you and if you leave it too late and that pressure builds, that means that the risk, if you get it wrong, is enormous. Um, yeah. And I mean, there are many, you know, there are the, there are the, the famous examples of your gaps that change their mark and it's so bad they have to change it back two weeks later. They are the tiny, tiny exception to the rule. Um, most of the time, most rebrands happen. Lots of people roll their eyes and say they don't like it online because our brains are programmed to not like something we've seen before, we've not seen before. And then right. two weeks later, you're still buying it because it's worked. But there is always that risk attached, which is why the conversation amongst marketers and agencies is more often than not about iterative change and it's about deciding how much of that change is required. Um, it's also worth saying, and Emma's mentioned it, you don't embark upon any significant piece of design or brand without KPIs attached and without return on investment baked into the plan. So it's not like it's just throwing money at the wall. This is an investment. Like, And if you're not doing it right, and if the team that's working this out for you don't have return on investment hardwired into the process, then, then maybe you shouldn't be doing it. Uh, mm -hmm. It should absolutely be returning value to you, ideally in the short to medium term. Mm -hmm. And one of the other KPIs as well, I think it's important alongside the kind of really hard stuff like the revenue and the market share and everything, is on the sort of brand love side of things and the empathy that you've built up. I am um, like this kind of conversation reminds me about um, the shocking moment in history where 20 years ago Opal Fruits rebranded to Starburst. And I, I don't know if I'm still over it. Like it was a big, it was a big change. <laughs> and um, that that was kind of that thing. It was what you were saying, Mark, at the start. People were outraged about it. Because like oh. the change was so drastic and everything. And there was even tweets to the actual sweets themselves. Um, but you know, over time it kind of became embedded that, that this was just the new the new brand that you you had to deal with. You, you had to get over it. But interestingly, I think as well, so that was. 20 years ago, we know a lot of brands are um, kind of capitalizing on nostalgia. And earlier this year, Opal Fruits came back mm. for a limited time. Right. And it was quite interesting to see how 20 years later, the sort of equity in that old name was still, uh -huh. was still there, that they were able to, to bring back and, and monetize um, 20 years later. I thought that was quite interesting. Right. Yeah, I mean, it might have even been arguably even stronger than it was, but you know, you kind of uh, don't know what you have till it's gone, and then it comes back in your excitement yeah. through the roof. So, <laughs> um, cool. Uh, well, I see a, a, we have a couple more questions coming in. Um, if you guys, uh, we're, we're just, we only have a, I have a couple more questions from Mark and Emma, and then we'll get to those in the Q and A. If you guys have any, uh, if anybody else has questions, just go ahead and add them there in the comments. Um, but I suppose, you know, kind of just bringing everything home then. Um, and if we're, you know, if I'm needing to choose A or B, you know, a, as a brand manager or a marketer, um, you know, what, what should I be looking at to inform whether I should do a rebrand or, or do an evolution? Um, how do I know which, which to choose or when to do what? There's no easy answer to that. You, you've, uh, First of all, you've got to look at your business circumstances. So if your business is growing and you're booming and everything's great, fantastic. Probably don't need to make significant changes to your your your, your brand. Or if you if you see a wave coming, if you yeah. think there is a requirement coming, because you've always got to think ahead, um, then you know you've got to brand is a is a response to a business need. So you know that that's that's the first thing. The the judgment call between radical change and iterative slow change is in the, that equity point, is in the value point. If you know that there is significant value locked up in the graphic identity, for example, you know, one, I mean, one example would be um, two of our clients that we've worked for in the past, um, IBM and Google. Google, embarked on what I think is probably the best rebrand of all time. Mm -hmm. Not one that people necessarily name, but 
they changed one of the biggest companies in the world, wholesale, a piece of work. I wish I wish the work we'd done with Google was at that level, but it, it was, you know, that is a, an astounding rebrand, whole scale, everything changed. And yet there was no negative. A lot of people didn't oddly realize they had done it. And yet now when you go back and you look at their old identity, which was framed around one product, and instead the vision, the business objective to them was, we want to create an empire, which has to work across endless different types of products and types of services yep. that that massive requirement that massive change that was needed for that business needed a rebrand very very clear mm -hmm. now compare that to something like ibm another one another client we've worked with for them the equity is locked up in that iconic mark it's locked up in that iconic corporate blue um so they're certainly not changing IBM's name or certainly not changing anything like that because they realized that's why that's a part yeah. of their share price. But they did add in a few years ago, I think it's quite a few years ago now, a brand platform all around smart, one word. And as a result, they have leveraged that word in campaigns, on product, yeah, in advertising, in, in pieces of sub-branding all over the world, all themed around one simple word. And that's the power of language, and that, that's smart. That's mm -hmm. a beautiful piece of brand evolution, at really, really sophisticated. And that shows the scale between the two pieces of work. Now, I've chosen two conglomerate mo monsters. In the real world, you've got to do the same thing. How much value is locked up in different parts of your identity? And if there isn't the value there and you have enormous business needs coming, that begins to eke out what the brief to a creative scene would be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. A anything you want to add to that, Emma? I, I mean, we're, we're just talking about, you know, how do, how do I know which to choose? Mm. Uh, wh where, do, where do you kind of start? Well, I think for me, a huge element of it is about future proofing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, whenever you're doing any, any piece of work or development on your brand, whether it is an evolution piece or particularly um, a rebrand piece, because it's, you know, such a, an extreme move in many cases, um, it's about understanding, is that going to be relevant in five years, 10 years time? Because we don't want to be rebranding all the time. If that is something that is happening, there, there's something that's not something's gone wrong somewhere if every two three years you're having to, to rebrand. But I also think like the future proofing also comes from the influence of external factors and um, particularly changes in um, consumer behavior or global economics, pandemics, all these kinds of things that have an impact. I think something that is really interesting that I've been reading about and keeping an eye on over the last couple of months has been um, South Korea's economic and societal plan is based on this concept of an untapped um, society. So everything is kind of moving towards using robots and technology um, to replace kind of human interaction in a lot of cases. Triggered um, or, or kind of uh, fueled by COVID-19, of course. It's really interesting to see that sort of substantial um, change in how people will live every day. Um, that brands need to think about now and should be you know, thinking about 10 years ago. Um, yeah. And that is going to have force brands um, to change and evolve um, their own brand, but also maybe their service or product offering as well, because it will get to a point where it becomes a matter of um, survival. You get companies and brands that uh, will be around for years and you'll get ones that kind of just naturally um, decline over the years. Um, so I think kind of keeping an eye on what is going on externally is, is crucial as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Cool. Um, well, I, I'm just looking at the time. Uh, we're running out of it, um, but I thought I thought we'd maybe get to some uh, some questions here really quick. If that's all right with you guys. Um, I've got one here from uh, from Katie. Let's see if that pops up. There we go. Um, says any advice for evolving a brand to a completely different audience without losing current consumers? Uh, in other words, currently targeting other older generations, but wanting to bring in more younger consumers. Mm. Um, well, without knowing the con without knowing the context of the company and knowing the detail, you know, of the brief, um, you've got two kind of abstract choices that um, 
we mentioned before the likes of Unilever um, uh, or P&G, these big giant groups, Diageo. There's a reason why they apply a brand architecture model the way they do, which is if you want to sell Dove soap and you want to sell Sensodyne toothpaste, the brand can't stretch that far. They're doing different things. One's talking to you know, one's talking to one market and another one's talking to another. So the mm-hmm. structural decision that they have taken is, and it's a big one and an expensive one, is we're gonna have to, we're gonna have a portfolio of 50 brands and each one is hyper targeted. So hula hoops talks to them and, and whoever talks to the other. Now, um, and that's the power of talking to one audience in in depth, particularly the one you've mentioned there, which is younger audiences. Younger audiences don't respond well to brands generally targeted to older audiences. Now, that's probably 90% sure that example does not apply to you because you can't have multiple brands. You know, you're building, you're not building necessarily a Unilever portfolio. So then the only option you have, shooting from the hip without knowing the circum the, the, the detail, is you have to find what common ground links those two. So generally what unites people is bigger than what divides them. You have to try and find the drivers to purchase or drivers to engagement with whatever the brand is, whatever the product is, and try and find, basically draw two circles and figure out wh- where is it then that there is some overlap. And that has to be your proposition in that in that middle. Mm-hmm. That's hard, linking brands between old and, and young. Um, and I wish you luck. Uh, but it'd be, in, it'd be interesting to know more, Katie, if you wanted to, to reach out yeah. and chat. Yeah. Uh, do you have anything to add to that, Emma? Oh, potentially I can talk about that for quite a while because that's an yeah. interesting one. And it is hard. It's hard to think the, the whole context. But um, what I would probably say, looking at the question, is around, well, I think it's interesting because the question is just the way it's worded as well. But one thing to bring in more of a younger con- and consumer. I think it's, it's always good to do a bit of um, research as well which I'm sure has been done, and, and looking into what the size of that younger segment is, is that really the right direction for us to go? And I'm kind of doing a bit of the, I think this is where the brand evolution comes into place really well, because mm-hmm. if we take the example media, if it's, if it's a younger audience that you're wanting to target, there's a good chance that social media marketing is part of the activity that you're doing, and it is a really cost-effective platform for starting um, to test these things. So it might be that actually is a cost-effective way to start kind of testing the water and seeing what's getting a response is to allocate a portion of your budget um, to uh, targeting a younger demographic so that it's content that is made for them that they will see and just try to understand how that goes down essentially. Um, is it getting the engagement? You might want to tweak it a wee bit. It, it doesn't it can't, can't be radically different to the overall brand you've got just now. There's got to be consistency there, it's got to link together and be true to what the brand is. But yeah. there might be also changes you do to test the water. And it might be that you find the response isn't what you expected it to be. And that's okay mm-hmm. because you found that out, you've done it in a clever and scientific way, and you haven't spent a fortune doing it yeah. and just taking the time to kind of learn about the different audiences and what they're receptive to and, and almost kind of you start to get in with that younger audience as well growing it over time and um, mm-hmm. going to become your kind of future uh, cohort really definitely i um, mean it, it's such a huge bonus for you know for the age we live in you can do small like you're saying smaller tests like that and you can test what you know what you think you know and see if that's actually true um and then apply it to you know rather than than just going out with all guns blazing so um okay uh great i think we've got time for one more um here's one from from graham uh forbes at what point is the damage done to a brand too great that a subsequent rebrand is likely to fail thinking specifically of rbs group changing the natwest this year uh, more than a decade on from Credit Crunch. Hmm. Uh, it comes back to that equity word. Mm-hmm. Um, equity, so value, is not fame. And things change. And that is a difficult question for heads of marketing, heads of brand, and heads of comms in large organizations, is they need to constantly ask what value is being added 
by the graphic assets, by the language, by different channels, and by the brand itself. And what's interesting is that following that crisis, following public ownership, everything, you know, it's a whole, do a whole webinar on that case study. Um, I've never worked for RBS. I've, ne I've not even worked in that sector too much. But um, following that, you could see they've gone on, they went on an evolutionary pattern. They were like, well, let's keep riding the storm, keep going, keep pushing, and then eventually we will come out and we will recover because eventually some brands do recover from critical damage. They do. Yeah. Um, but at some point, someone has come in and made that value call and that equity call. And they said, actually, if we remove, just because the brand is well known, it does not mean it is adding value. And that is, that is the name. That is the whole identity. Um, and so in answer to, to, to Graham's question, um, it won't be one point. It won't, there won't be one moment. I mean, things like the news of the world shutting down, that's a very rare event because their brand became instantly too toxic to, to continue. Most mm -hmm. of the time, you will gradually slip into irrelevance. And right. you have to make that call early on to go, okay, we can we can rebrand, we can course correct. But the example there of, of NatWest and RBS, that's the example of what happens when you don't do brand evolution and you don't do a rebrand and then you don't do a really, really urgently needed rebrand. Yeah. And then eventually you're you're over. Your brand dies, or you go under, or your BHS. Mm -hmm. You know. So although BHS is a bad example because I think they did something like four rebrands in six years, and none of them worked. Because so um, so no, I, I hope that I hope that gives some answer. It's all about equity and realizing that if the if the equity problem you have is in your design assets or in your language, that that can be fixed. If your equity problem is in your whole business, yeah, so much that branding can do. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Cool. Um, well, I um, I think we we'd better finish up then. Um, I'm just going to give everyone uh, just a couple of quick things here. Um, so basically, um, if you like what you're hearing, um, you know th there are a few things that you can do. Uh, first off, just thanks for for spending your lunch with us, everyone. Um, but if you if you want to learn more, um, there are a couple of posts that we've put up. Uh, this one went up this morning on the Made Brave blog. Uh, it's called the Rebrand versus Brand Evolution, which is better for your brand, um, which is kind of what we've been going over here. So there's there's more of that uh, if you want to go check that out. Um, we also wrote another one recently. Um, called how to use content to prototype test and evolve your brand and that's a little bit you know that's more kind of what emma was talking about um which is where you you can do these smaller tests uh, you know you can build a prototype you can test that and then you can adjust and then you can do that again and again and again um and that's how you you know there's kind of more practical advice uh if you want to do um kind of take the brand evolution approach um and then of course if you need help building a strategy uh for your brand or your business uh we have a team here and they do just that um and we'd love to chat with you uh, about how we can help you bring your brand to life. Um, so again, it's just head to the website. If you go to the, the header menu there, uh, there's a contact us button. You just hit that uh, and we'd love to talk to you all about it. We could talk about it all day. Um, thanks so much uh, for everybody's questions. Thanks again for coming. Thanks to Mark. Thanks to Emma. Thanks for sharing your time with us. Um, and we will see you all again, uh, probably in two or three weeks. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.